I am going to get some hate for this video because the world is not 4.5 billion years old and this is why. Hemsby is an English seaside town living on the edge, quite literally. Because if you look closely, you'll see these exact landmarks 30 years ago. And this is them today. So fast is the erosion of these cliffs that in December 2023, some of the residents lost their sheds, gardens and entire houses to the retreating cliff edge. So, if you're an atheist, you solve my problem for me. If the earth really is billions of years old and if there are places quite literally all around the world just like Hemsby which are receding quicker than my hairline, how is it that we have any land left? Surely at this rate it wouldn't even take a million years to eat up much of the earth. Or will you tell me that places like Hemsby were a hundred miles bigger a billion years ago? But I hear you, you're saying, Joe, can't you be a born again Christian and believe in an old earth and also in macro evolution? Well I want to talk about that a little bit later. Right now though, I want you to answer this question for me. Because if you go to Utah, you will find a place that will make you think twice about the age of the earth. Arches National Park has 2,000 rock arches and I quote their explanation for this is because millions of years of erosion and weathering are responsible. However, something isn't quite adding up here because between the years 1977 and 2015 the park rangers have reported that 43 of these rock arches have collapsed due to further erosion they say. So if you do the maths that's on average one per year. So here's my big question, if the earth was even 100,000 years old, how would we have any left? Of course they can't take millions of years to form, but it actually seems more likely that they are 4,000 years old, which of course makes sense if you believe like me that they were formed after the biblical account of Noah's flood. Come on, let's be honest with one another. It's no secret that the most quoted line from the atheist is this, the burden of proof is on you. Well I'm okay if you want to say that because I want to say to you Mr or Mrs Atheist just open your eyes, look at the beautiful world around you and if you look at pretty much any landmark you will see evidence that the earth is young. Niagara Falls on average goes back one foot every year. So why is it that it hasn't cut through 200 million feet of earth yet since the Pangaea supercontinent split? There's even a rock named after Charles Darwin in the Galapagos Islands and guess what? In May 2021 it collapsed. I'm kind of angry at myself that I didn't get a picture of this but this was long before I was making YouTube videos and I got an opportunity to have a cave tour in the Peak District. And the guide as lovely as she was was telling us all around you are stalactites and stalagmites that are two million years old. And as she was speaking, one of my friends was leaning on a brand new steel railing. It can only have been a few years old. And my friend, who was also a Christian, just nudged me and pointed to a stalagmite that was about two or three inches long, growing on this brand new steel railing. And he sort of whispered in my ear, they must think that we're stupid. If it takes millions of years for these seven foot stalactites to grow, why is it that one of these little guys can grow so quickly in the space of a few years? Okay, I can't believe I'm about to do this, but I'm about to tell you why I believe macro evolution is totally false. And as I've already mentioned, later in the video I want to talk about why some Christians do believe in theistic evolution. And I've actually got another video all about that, so make sure you subscribe if you'd like to see that. But right now I'm going to tell you why I personally cannot buy into this idea of species to species evolution. Now I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I'm some kind of expert. We both know that I'm not. I can barely spell my name on a good day. But here's the reason why I'm not about to jump onto the evolution bus in any hurry. The reason is this. They still haven't found the missing link. So just stop me if I get something wrong, but if we really did evolve from a common ancestor, you'd expect us to find millions and millions of these pre-human fragments and bones in the ground. You'd expect to see them all around the world, and yet we only have a handful. And the ones that we do have, can I say this, they look a little sketchy when you dig 
a little deeper. You may want to write this down because Professor Stephen Jay Gold, a non-Christian paleontologist and the author of many books on why evolution is great, many books on biology, even he admits that most hominid fossils, even though they serve as a basis for endless speculation and elaborate storytelling, are fragments of jaws and scraps of skulls. In other words, evolutionists are doing the exact thing that they attribute to creationists like me. They are building huge narratives around a tiny piece of evidence just to support their theory. Take a look at this. This is Java Man, a supposed 1.5 million year old subhuman who is proof, according to the evolutionists, that we evolved. Except there is little evidence that Java Man is even remotely ape-like. Below the neck he is almost identical identical to your modern man, and even his brain size is within our range. And where his skeleton was found, did you know there was also very advanced tools found in the same area? Which leads us to believe that Java Man was much more intelligent than we are being told, and he was likely just a fully formed human being, just like you, and just like me. You've probably already heard of Neanderthals, but the same story goes for those guys. Their remains are often found next to fashion tools, and new research is even claiming that Neanderthals were the first artists who were able to paint these old cave paintings. But the artists that we have today, what do they do? Well, they portray Neanderthals as very primitive ape-like creatures. But the reality is, if a Neanderthal stepped in front of you, you would find it very hard to distinguish the difference between him and a modern man. Okay, brace yourself, because this is the part where the missing link bandwagon really starts to fall to pieces. Meet Lucy. Lucy is probably one of the most famous examples that the evolutionist will hold up when they say we want to prove the missing link. But what they don't tell you is that in Lucy's skeleton, which is preserved at the National Museum of Ethiopia. One of the fossils, which is supposed to be part of one of the bones of Lucy, was tested and has come back as a baboon's bone. So, am I the only one when I hear that? It kind of makes me think, doesn't that discredit the rest of the collection? Not only that, in all of the depictions that we see of Lucy, we see her as an upright, upward walking being, just like us. But nowhere does any scientist ever claim to have been able to find Lucy's feet for the skeleton. So it's actually a little imaginative to put Lucy standing tall on two feet. And what's even crazier is that the Journal of Nature released an article which stated that they had studied Lucy's hand bones. And what did they find? They found features that are associated with knuckle walking. So come on Joe, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this, I believe that Lucy is just another monkey that moves around on her hands and feet. The same can be said for Ardy, another supposed missing link, whose pelvis was so crushed it was said it was like Irish stew, so it was concluded that we might not even know whether he could walk on two feet, and he likely could just be a modern ape too. And if you thought that Lucy's baboon bone was bad, well that's nothing compared to the Piltdown blunder. Charles Dawson, an amateur fossil collector, decided he wanted to make a name for himself. Perhaps because his name is so similar to Charles Darwin, he wanted to be another Darwin and get a bit of extra cash. But Dawson played a trick on the world that lasted for decades. He wrote a letter to one of the biggest movers and shakers in the science world, a man called Dr. Arthur Woodward. In it, he claimed that he had found the missing link, a jawbone and a skull fragment, and he called it the Piltdown Man because it was found in the Piltdown region of England. Bizarrely, Dr. Woodward ran with the idea immediately. After all, the skull had a, a flat human-like face and a high forehead, and so the news spread across the world that Piltdown Man was officially the missing link which everyone had been waiting for. However, years later in 1953, a chemical analysis was done on Piltdown Man, and to the scientist's dismay, the jaw and teeth came back as the fragments of an orangutan skull and also parts of a modern human 
human. And it kind of makes you think, where did he find the latter? But perhaps the most embarrassing of all is the Nebraska man, because what happened here makes Richard Dawkins himself question the validity of evolution. In 1922, a pre-human tooth was discovered in Nebraska, and the story began to trend in all the newspapers around the world. The missing link has been found. Evolution has been proven true. Here in the USA, we have a scientific discovery. And a picture of what the scientists believe Nebraska man looked like was even published using quite a bit of artistic license. They illustrated it in the London News. And then finally the tooth was tested and it was proven to be nothing more than a pig's tooth. The scientists had been hamming it up all along. Okay, okay, I get it. I, it's time to stop porking fun at the evolutionists. But I do hope you can see my heart right now. Yes, although I don't believe in macroevolution, and although I personally don't believe the Earth is old, I want you to know I don't like it when Christians fall out over these topics. Because, you see, as Christians, we're not saved on whether we believe the earth is young or old. We're saved only on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, if you're an atheist listening right now, I hope you can see there's no bitterness. There's only love for you guys as well. And I'd love to talk to you more about the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's ask the obvious question here. Why do I believe that the earth is young. Why do I believe the Earth is only 6,000 years old? Well, the first thing to remember, and this will make my atheist friends right now cringe, but the first thing to remember is my first authority is the Word of God. I believe the Bible. Why? Because when you read the Bible, you will discover that you're not actually reading the Bible. The Bible is reading you. It finds exactly who you are and reads right into your inner being. So when I read the Bible, I believe it when it says, the genealogies from Adam to Abraham were 2,000 years if you add up all of those people. And then you go from Abraham to Jesus, you get another 2,000 years. And then of course from Jesus Christ to us now, we get another 2,000 years. So for the benefit of anyone who's having a siesta right now, that's 6,000 years. And that's why we believe the earth is around 6,000 years old as young earth creationists. But this next part is very important. So you might just want to catch this. Because the biggest reason why I believe that evolution is false is because there's something I know to be absolutely true, and that's the gospel. And the gospel would actually teach that evolution must be a lie. The Bible says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Can you see it yet? Well, what if I read this famous verse to you? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now do you understand? According to the Bible, death is sadly the result of sin. The moment that Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the moment they gave themselves over to sin, is the moment that death entered into the world. If there was no sin, there would be no death. The scripture also says, the soul that sins shall surely die. So why does this disprove macroevolution? Well, because evolution tells us that all life came from primordial soup, and gradually over millions of years we evolved into fish, and then from fish into amphibians, and then from amphibians into reptiles, from reptiles to mammals, from mammals to apes, and bingo, you get a human being. Now, for this process to be true, you need a whole heap of death over millions of years. And of course, that's what the evolutionists bases their theory off. They base it off the fossil records of dead species in the ground, which they claim is millions of years old. But the Bible clearly states that death only entered into the world as a byproduct of Adam's sin. In fact, in Romans 8, it says that all creation, all of the animals, they groan. They long for the day when their creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, will return and will make everything back like Eden. Why? Because our sin has brought them also into this mess. Because you and I 
have sinned because our first father, Adam, sinned and disobeyed God. Now I don't want anyone to leave here today without remembering this vital piece of information. Jesus Christ is our creator. The Bible says, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made. So when we read in the Gospels all about Jesus performing miracles, the question needs to be asked, does he do it instantly or does it take him hours, days, weeks, even years to perform these miracles? When he commanded that fish to come out of the ocean with a coin in its mouth, did it happen gradually or was it instant? When Jesus Christ turned the water into wine, was it gradual or was it instant? And above all, when he commanded the wind and the waves of the sea to be still, was it a gradual process that took a long, long time or was it instant? Of course, it was instant. So the Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same today, yesterday and forevermore, if he is the same person, do you not think it would make sense that when he created the world that we read in Genesis 1, when he created it, he did it in the exact same way, just like he spoke the sea to be still? Would it not make sense that when in Genesis 1 it says he spoke life into existence, he did it instantly in the exact same way, not over millions of years, like many people are starting to believe in the Christian church. Now, please, everyone look at me. As I said in my David Attenborough video, I have friends who I love very much. There are Bible teachers, professors who I cherish, and they all hold this position of an old earth. And I want you to know that I don't love you any less because you hold this position. If you're an atheist even, and you're listening to me, I love you to pieces too, know that. Whether you want me to love you or not, that's another question. But the truth is this, as Christians, we are all on the same team. And I think it is very sad when we fall out over these things, because the world is watching. And Jesus Christ himself said, the way that people will know that you are my disciples in the way that we love one another. And I just hope that you don't mind me personally saying why I have deep convictions on why I do believe evolution is false. And why I think it is kind of sad that the Bible seminaries, the Christian churches have allowed unbelieving scientists to shape our thinking, to interpret our Bible and tell us, no, that can't be true because our science claims that it isn't. And if I've shown you one thing in this video, I hope I've proved this. There are actually many holes in the theory of evolution. And Mr. Atheist, it's okay if you want to write right now in my comment section, God of the gaps theory. Yes, that's fine. I do believe that God is the God of the gaps. You see, the Lord God will come into your life and he will fill all of the holes. Right now, you have a hole inside of your heart that will not be satisfied by all the money, all the fame, all the success, all the dopamine boosts this world can offer you will never fill that God-shaped hole. Only Jesus Christ can fill that. There is a gap that you and I have. Here is this holy God and he is here. And here are you and I and our sin. And our sin has separated us from God. And yet Jesus Christ stands in the gap. He is the bridge between man and God. He is the mediator, the one who was put on a cross for your sin. He stood there in the gap, fully God, fully man, dying in your place and mine so that you and I could be forgiven, so that all of our sins can be washed away and we can have a fresh start and we can be reconciled with God. Yes, Jesus Christ is the God of the gaps. And then Jesus Christ was put in a tomb, in a big gap, and he filled that tomb and stayed there for one, two, three days, but on the third day he rose from the dead. And right now, if you go into Jerusalem, you will see a tomb which we believe is the garden tomb, and that tomb is empty. There's a big gap there because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. My dear friends, you would be very wise to put your trust in the God of the gaps because he'll come into your life and he'll fill it with hope and the Holy Spirit. So what are you waiting for? Come to him right now and he'll give you a new life and a new beginning. It might surprise you that when I first started this YouTube channel, Off The Curb Ministries, one of my main goals was to reach atheists. Now a lot's changed since then, but if you'd like to see one of the first videos I made on this channel where I interviewed an academic, a professor, Professor Stephen Taylor, and asked him all the questions that my little brain could never handle, all about young earth and why he as an academic is a young earth creationist, please click here, I think you'll find it helpful. 
helpful. And if you did find this video in any way a blessing and you liked it, please do a favour for me and consider subscribing. I really would like to see you again. God bless you all and thank you for watching.